Um, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Erica Brudis, and I'm the Vice President of Western Canada for Enterprise Canada, a strategic communications firm. Uh, we do a lot of media training. It's one of our core businesses. And so today we're doing media training for all of you folks. Um, we do media training for large corporations, not for profit folks, people, uh, elected officials. And so no matter who the audience is, I know that talking to media is never the most comfortable thing to do. So our purpose today is to familiarize yourself, familiarize all of you with um, some of the tips and tactics for media relations that goes for if you are the spokesperson up and talking to the media or you are a part of the team that's uh, briefing and preparing a spokesperson um, for, for that media interview. So why we're here today is first and foremost to increase knowledge of the media landscape. Now the media landscape has changed significantly in the last decade uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means on your end but just understanding you know the role of journalists, um, how their, their timelines and everything has changed and then just to get you a little bit more uh, comfortable with what that turnaround time looks like. The second part with that is also building confidence in working with media. So as I mentioned, it's never, it doesn't matter, I've done thousands of interviews and you're never as, as comfortable as you would be talking to friends in your own home, but realizing you know, that they're doing their job, understanding the landscape and building that confidence uh, through practice will be your best bet. So we'll, we'll touch base on some of those tools uh, and resources you can use to build that confidence. And then lastly, again, further developing those skills for great interviews. We'll go through uh, preparation for interviews, an interview itself, um, some of the things to consider, and then as well, kind of looking at campaigns and how to, to broadly, broadly share your story. One of the biggest things is always, you know, finding that connection. We all are members of society and we always want to understand what's in it for me or what does this mean for me and my family? And that's a big thing that we'll talk about throughout. Um, but regardless of if you're a spokesperson for your organization or not, having some media training under your belt is always a great place uh, to be in. So we're going to start with the five key, five key principles. The biggest thing is do your research. So do your homework, um, have a checklist of all the things you want to accomplish, and then rehearse. And that's not just for some of you that are more on the technical side. Um, you really want to make sure that you know and you're setting yourself up for success and you're understanding how you want your story to come across, what you want um, the headline to be. And that leads us into the second step, which is planning for the win. So know what success looks like for you. What is that headline? What is the story? What is the, you know, the tangible messages and narrate the um, narrative that you want to be driven and really start looking at that. I always explain it like when you're driving on the highway and you're going around a turn, you don't look straight ahead. You look at where um, you're trying to go and you steer accordingly. That's the exact same as you uh, want to prepare for a media interview. You want to look at your end game and be comfortable as you steer towards that direction, never getting pulled off course. Um, so the next, it's about them and them being your audience. So that could be in a situation, the media outlet themselves or also the audience you want to speak to. So if you're talking about a project that might be, you know, for schools or young families or something within a municipality that, that has some value add to the audience of a family. You want to be speaking to them. You want to tell the story of how that impacts their daily life and really make it so that they feel a connection to the story. You can humanize it, personalize it, and that will really help you connect to your audience. Uh, if it's a media outlet, you know, understanding their background on the issue or maybe a personal connection that they have to it. And again, just trying to make a connection between the story you're telling and the audience that you uh, are in front of. That also goes, as we're on that, for those of you that may not be spokespeople on a day-to-day -day basis, but you are very much uh, involved in presentations, in you know, doing webinars, which seems to be the new norm for all of us, 
uh, this is a great, these are great tools to take into consideration uh, whenever. It even works for when you're at home and you want your partner or your family to, to take action on something. If you know your audience, you likely get to a better result. So these tools can help you in all aspects of your professional and possibly personal life. Um, the fourth one is it's also about you. So similar to, you know, myself, if I had just gotten out of bed, I had, you know, makeup smeared or I didn't look presentable or, um, you know, I had a distracting hair piece that was out, it would really take away from the impression and my ability to keep your focus through this presentation. So, you know, dressing for success wasn't just a statement made. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to be wearing fashion forward or, or those types of more um, superficial things matter. It's more just looking presentable. So present yourself the way you would want to be interpreted. Uh, I wore a solid color so that there's not a bunch of distraction, um, you know, trying to keep a backdrop behind me. It's just making sure that, especially in a webinar world, that you're not giving people a reason to look away from, from the camera. There's less personal connection through webinars and then also through media. So you are on, if you're on camera or you're doing an interview where there's an ability to lose the audience's attention, you really want to have something that's making sure that your message is the strongest thing coming forward. And that, you know, similar, even in presentations, you walk into a room, you want to conduct yourself, command the room and really garner the attention of those sitting around you. Um, the last one is to be current. Now, that means various things, you know, it's it's knowing what's happening in your community, what is happening uh, with the issue that you're talking about. Um, it's not just an overall assumption, but, you know, understanding and kind of coming back to that research uh, priority that we talked about as the first first key, key uh, priority is you know, making sure you do your homework. So if you're current, you're up to date, you can understand or even reference to add, you know, subject matter uh, expertise by understanding some of the background. So always making sure that you're prepared, making sure that you, your, your pr presentation, your professionalism, everything is current. Um, so I want to move on to today's media landscape, and I think that's because, you know, we all are engaged with media, whether it's digital and social, we watch the news, we're, you know, interacting with the media in our professions. That's changed a lot in the last while, um, and if those of you that used to, you know, receive the, the mail on your front steps every morning and that's the first way that you you learned what was happening in the world you looked at the fold so was it at the top of the paper was it at the bottom um, was it on a1 was it on b6 to know where the importance or the the the, the significance of your story landed the term landed means basically it could be anywhere on social and it's all online. People aren't waiting for their newspaper anymore. They're not waiting for the six o'clock news. Um, it's all online and it's about being available in this moment and immediately not just being available. So when you see things like available, you know, was not available for content or for comment, that in today's world means was not available immediately. And you know, the, the rapid pace in which we're all living our day-to-day -day lives and how we scroll through Twitter to get our news or LinkedIn, um, that's the world of the journalist as well. So they're working in, in real time. You know, the, the benefit of it is sometimes if it is a 60 second news cycle, um, your, your story, if it's uh, an issue, could get a little bit more drowned out. However, there's trends, there's all these other ways to boost the, the story. Um, we also, from a positive note, when you're trying to tell a good news story, you really have to understand that you're working uh, in real time. There's a pressure to be first. So, you know, we're also seeing journalists maybe not report as as accurately or as as uh, with as much due diligence as they used to because they're acting to try and be the first out of the gate. They wanna publish it first online um, and corrections and retractions are different and the implications of those are different than they would be in a newspaper. So what does that really mean? I mean, when we're looking at the severity of how important social media is, it is, 
can change your life. Uh, we all remember this tweet where Justine was boarding a plane. She tweeted, you know, meaning no harm in what she thought she was putting down. And by the time she landed in Africa, her entire life had changed. Uh, she, you know, was no longer employed by the company and she had received so much, um, you know, criticism and feedback that, you know, she was now a household name. This, the purpose of this slide is to remind you too that we are living in real time. There's 60 second news cycles, but everything that goes online still has uh, a lifespan and it could be, you know, the things you don't want traction for, you'll get, um, and the ability to retract or explain herself um, was not the case because we live in a social media world. So, you know, what's the impact of this and what does it mean for your organization? We're in a constant news cycle. So that means that deadlines and filing and things that we used to know about needing to get back to journalists, needing to have your, your quote or statement by a certain time, or if you're announcing something that you have to be very strategic on the time and location so that everyone can file and get it into print for the next morning's newspaper is a thing of the past. Again, touching on speed over substance, we're seeing that quick action response, high pressure for journalists to, to be not only the first to get the scoop, but the first to file. And that unlimited sources mean we hear it all the time where it's like, I, you know, based on Twitter or this comment came through or this happened, the, the credibility um, of sources, you know, has, has limited in some people's perspectives, but it's also increased the access that people can have because of everyone sharing information and having things uh, accessible at our fingertips. So the biggest thing to take away is the world of journalism has changed for the profession as well. Um, if you're, I'm based in Edmonton, so I'll use this example. The Edmonton Journal and the Edmonton Sun now shares a desk, meaning if you're pitching a story, you're going to the same reporter likely who will write two different stories because the audience, which is very important, is two different news cycles. So we're dealing with the pressure to keep a job. Many journalists have left their field. Um, you know, they're, they're amongst, they're shrinking in growth, their stress scores are up. So they have added pressure to do their job and really push the envelope on the stories that they're telling. Um, so understanding where they're coming from is, is they've, they've got some internal pressures on their end and they're looking for those big stories to tell. So what are they thinking? Media will cover what's interesting and that comes back to the pressures that they're feeling in their roles, um, not necessarily what you think is important. So you've got to grab their attention, you've got to hook them on your story and you've got to give them a clear and concise message in order for them to be able to turn it around, for them to get traction and feel like that story was worth their time and their audience's time. So what do they want from you? They want believability and credibility, consistency, emotion. So that emotion and unique perspectives is what's the angle that you're doing differently? What story are you telling um, that's either an exclusive, uh, behind the scenes, you know, VIP type story that you can share with them to make them feel like they're the first out of the gate, that they're telling a different story and ultimately either selling, you know, more newspapers, becoming a more popular journalist, validating their, their job, um, you know, when it comes to issues. So we all like telling the good news stories, but there is you know, always, and you see it in the news more often than not, the controversial topics, conflict, they're looking to position two different sides. They'll try and get, you know, contrasting quotes and maybe try and catch you off guard. And that's where it comes back to being prepared and doing your research. You need to be aware of all of those things happening so that you can already position yourself to answer those questions. They're going to look for local voices. So if you're working for, for a municipality um, or, you know, within a community and you're trying to tell that story, finding third party people. So if you're telling that story about this new community infrastructure, maybe a playground, we'll take that. And you're talking to parents, have a parent tell that story. It's way stronger than, you know, an elected official sometimes or, um, you know, a member that's part of the organization that's 
being paid to be there as opposed to the local impact that a parent can tell that narrative um, with the proper support and and back uh, information of experts can really help amplify your story and get more unique perspectives and believability from a journalist but at the end of the day i have had numerous situations where i have done a 10 minute interview and i get a half sentence quote um, you know, they're trying to fit it into their story. So a lot of times they've written the, uh, a large section of their story and they're looking for those sound bites or quotes uh, from you that will be able to fit in and weave into the story. So they decide you're not, do not be upset if, you know, your, your quote or your interview isn't fully captured, that will happen. Um, you, you obviously will practice and try and create those, those messages that will help bridge and make sure that you don't get misperceived or, or misquoted. However, they do decide, so where or if, and even if you don't make it into the, the news story, uh, sometimes not being quoted is also a success. It just depends on what issue uh, you are addressing as a company or an organization. So what do you need to do to prepare for an interview? And that is where that preparedness comes in and where you need to really focus on the end game that you're trying to achieve. Number one, internalize key messages. So stay on message. If you feel like you're repeating yourself so much that you're going blue in the face, say it one more time. Um, I'm a communicator by trade, and if I didn't know that I had to say things seven, eight times over before the message, um, will actually be digested, you know, then I, then I don't know what I'm doing because that is something that's very important. You need to repeat yourself. Um, you can say things very, very differently. Uh, an example is, you know, talking about the weather. You can say, it is really nice out today. You say, well, it's really wonderful that it's no longer snowing or it's no longer raining. Um, I can't wait to spend my lunch hour outdoors. Uh, this evening, I'm going to go out for a bike ride. You know, the sun is shining. It's blue. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe how high the temperature is uh, at this time of year? Or, you know, looking forward to barbecuing all week with the type of weather we're having. These are ways of saying it's nice out um, and various ways where you're creating a personal hook of talking about barbecuing or bike riding or talking about the color of the sky. These are all messages ultimately in a different way to say the same thing as which it's nice out. Um, and that's something that when you're sticking on message is a really great thing to focus on is you're coming back to the same bottom line or the same takeaway. It's just how you say it. And that's one of the tricks of doing uh, media interviews is sticking to your message, talking till you sound blue in a face to drive that narrative. What journalists are looking for is the second you get off message. Um, and that's where it comes to getting outside your message box. So some of the things to be conscious of and the journalists are, are sometimes trying to position to get a little bit more information is, you know, if you're saying hypotheticals or you're overthinking a question, the biggest thing is they ask you a question, only answer that question. Answer it by facts. If it sounds boring to them, they might ask you something else. But don't try and overshare. Don't give run on responses. Um, again, hypotheticals are huge because that's a place where you can get misquoted or, you know, they won't say that, you know, he, in theory, this ha could happen. Um, and, and also speculating the actions of others. When you're talking about your message and your narrative, don't let it talk, don't let the speculation or understanding of other people's actions uh, impact the message you're driving. You may agree or disagree, but the purpose of your interview is to tell your story. So if those things start to happen, it doesn't mean that you're hooped. It just means you need to get your messages back on track and you'll have your messages, your talking points, facts are something that are very difficult to misconstrue. And the actions are kind of that, that tie back to, you know, we're doing this in the community because it's very important. We heard from 80% of residents, there's your fact, um, and what we're doing is we're adding value to the, the, the children of the community so that they can play outside. 
Um, obviously during COVID, that's not a message that will be driven, but having your messages, having your talking points, and when talking points, it makes it a little bit more formal or a little more free flowing um, in how you're communicating your point. And facts, like I said, there's no harm in that. Um, and actions are that tie back to what you've done to get there, what this means for the community. So bridging your message, don't repeat accusations. So again, those sound bites, if they say, well, we heard this, this, and this, you don't sit, you say, well, what we're here to talk about today is actually this project and just weave it back. You can say, I, you know, we've heard it a lot in the news. They say, I don't uh, appreciate the premise of that question. So you're not using the verbiage again. You're simply going and talking about what you want to talk about. Many times you see this happen where you're like, I don't think that those people actually answered the question because they have their messages. And if the question doesn't fit, you can bridge it or block the question um, and then back in and say, well, that's an interesting point. But what I want to talk about today or what this project entails or why this is a benefit to our residents is. And that's a great way to be able to reaffirm your narrative. The other thing is anticipate those questions that journalists are going to ask. They're going to, you know, try and lead you down to sharing more information, maybe ask you speculative questions or or others' perspectives. The more you practice those bridges and those pivots back to what you want to talk about, the better. So that's where the confidence comes in. If you practice a lot, it's you know going into a presentation and you could do it with your eyes closed, same, same idea. If you can come out of a media interview saying that was actually easier than, um, than all the prep we did, that is success for the entire team. For years, I did question period prep at the legislature. And if you had elected officials saying that they that you they got beat up in in QP prep more than they they did in the, the questions from the opposition, you know that you were setting your team up for success. So feel free to get into those tough questions behind closed doors in preparation for the person that's going to be speaking up. Now, I may have made media sound uh, like they couldn't be your best friend. Um, but, but that doesn't mean you can't build relationships with them. Again, they're doing their job just like you are on your end, trying to tell a story, trying to get to the bottom of the issue, but there's no reason why you can't build relationships and rapport. You'll find journalists or media outlets or, um, you know, online companies that you can link to and that really do align with with your business or your organization or the story you're trying to tell. So feel free. I mean, the one piece of advice though is just to know that you're never off the record. Um, think of it like a comedian where when you have a friend that's a comic and how many times you know, you've know you seen it on TV where they're talking about their relationship, they're talking about a friend's situation, you're kind of fair game in that world. And you just wanna make sure that that is something that you're cognizant of, is that it is a relationship, but the more you can keep it professional, the more you will be successful. The next thing is think visual. So that's both in the demeanor, but it's also looking at you know what's behind you. If I had, you know, a very distracted photo or something with a giant uh, thing coming out of my head, it would really take away. Um, and you wanna be aware that you're, you're looking at this holistically when you're doing especially an on-camera interview or in this case, uh, a webinar. And the last thing we kind of talked about when we were talking about staying current um, is be aware of your news and your industry. So something like the Calgary Design Ideas Help Physical Distancing. Right now, so many folks are talking about COVID. Uh, so many are talking about now a return to work. Um, and for, for, for many of you, high density or planning um, around these types of issues uh, will be top of mind. So just being aware of what other court companies, what other organizations, um, and also what subject matters are important to your audience. And you'll be able to, to, to bridge some of those stories or have a reference point um, when you're trying to explain something. So if you're talking about high density and, and you feel like there's an easier way to tell the story, which is by giving an example, knowing what's current in your industry will really put you ahead of the game and make you a thought leader as opposed to reactionary to questions and almost 
you know, building that confidence so you don't feel like you um, are grasping for an example. So now moving on to the interview. And like I said, whether this is for a presentation or you're briefing someone, um, everyone in the briefing room or in the pre-interview, which is more important than the interview itself, uh, will be getting someone or a group to this point. Now there's always lessons learned. And like I said, you could maybe not get quoted. Um, you could be misquoted slightly that it just didn't hit, didn't land the way you wanted. Um, these are all things to consider, but setting yourself up for success and really understanding what you want uh, going into the interview will put you in the best position. So be prepared for no, you know, that's, that's one of those things that you're going to hear me say seven to eight times to try and make sure that you are over prepared. There's really no such thing as in an interview. I did it when I used to do a lot of speaking engagements. As I was driving to the event, I talk out loud. Um, I always travel by myself for that reason, but I talk out loud, I run through scenarios, um, I do that going into presentations, I anticipate as much as possible because that helps me feel confident when I'm entering that room and the more I'm prepared, the better of a, of a presentation or the better interview I will, will put forward. Again, you're answering questions in interviews or in presentations for that matter, not asking questions. So be message driven, know what you wanna get out of it and really ensure that you leave that room knowing that the one or two things that you want people to take away, they did. Uh, I would hope that being prepared and doing your research or your homework is something uh, that you folks will take away. I'm not asking you, I'm telling you that that is something that's very, very important because it will set you up for success, it will build your confidence and it will have you positioned to go into that um, interview at, at, you know, at the top of your game. Keeping it simple. Now that sounds obviously simple, but the thing with keeping it simple is you don't want to overcomplicate it. A lot of you folks are specialists and expertise within your field, um, making sure that what you're saying can be understood by the audience that is receiving your message. So, you know, be the expert, answer the question, uh, as clear and clean and direct as possible. And don't try and build or give a interview interviewee a reason to expand on that question. Stockpile top line messages. So like we said, you know, repeat the same thing, come back to the one thing that you want people to remember from that interview or from that story. Uh, you could have four things that you say four different times each and that's 16 answers as opposed to feeling like you really need to be innovative. Interviews are about telling a story. If your story doesn't need to be innovative on the ideas and thought process, don't make it be. It needs to be authentic. The messages need to come from a place of authenticity and integrity and journalists will know if they are not. Um, be strategic. Again, that comes into how you're going to play off of off of the reporter, how you're going to prepare, and uh, most importantly, the strategy about how you're going to ensure that your audience gets the right message. So paving that, um, that interview, understanding where you want to pivot, what you don't want to answer, and how you're going to answer the question that you want to answer again, is the most strategic thing. Keeping it simple is also very, very strategic when it comes to having a strong interview. So here's a little bit, uh, just a tool that you folks could use. Um, issues don't necessarily need to be negative, but if it, you are being more reactive to something or you have a good story to tell in the sense of a project launching, the issue is you know, either reacting or it's being proactive to the story you want to tell. So either way, we'll call it an issue, but you're identifying what needs to be told to your audience. Then you develop a strategy, and that could be everything from, you know, is it if it's a negative, you might want to be a little bit more quiet or give an exclusive to one reporter to hope that your story comes out the way you want. Um, it might be, you know, releasing a blanket statement. It might be putting it out on Twitter. It might be the, you know, Facebook Live or posting a video that, you know, can add to that human component of having a face talk to you as opposed to just words. Um, that might be all the different things that your team or as a team you'll look at to develop a strategy. 
From that strategy, then you're going to prepare for the media engagement. And obviously, the preparation will vary based on what channel or what method you want to you want to go about. Um, and then, if it is a live interview or one where you know you're doing um, a pre-recorded anything like that, you'll likely want to go through the media training, which again could be you know the 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 101 type stuff we're doing today. Uh, if you are a spokesperson, it also is probably on that key issue. So you'll go through the training, which is the preparation, which is the pre-interview um, deck that we reviewed. The outreach will likely not come from necessarily you, but that's understanding from your communication folks. What's the deadline? What are they trying to, you know, what story are they trying to tell? There's no reason you can't ask a news outlet when they do a call about a comment to say, you know, what, what, what are you trying to achieve or what's the story about, um, what's the issue you're hearing and trying to best prepare yourself and then writing a briefing note which has those backgrounds which is your industry knowledge and your current events. Uh, it's your key points, your key messages, your facts, your actions, your talking points and then blending it all together. Now these might not happen in a sequential order, they're kind of all happening in tangent but these are three moving pieces that once you decide your strategy will need to be executed. Adopting the right tone. And that's something, especially if you're on the phone um, or you're you know, trying to write an email statement, uh, you really wanna make sure that when you read it out loud, that's how it comes across. Or when you're, when you're talking that you know, you're, you're setting the tone. So if it's a somber emotion, you're not smiling like this the whole time and sounding very chipper. Or if it is something that's exciting, you don't look like this and you're just reading from a page and you're going to lose all of your media interest. So again, adopting the tone. This may sound bad that I'm sharing this, but sometimes I talk in front of the mirror to understand what I look like as I'm conveying a message to make sure that it's approachable if it needs to be approachable, if it's direct and stern that that also comes across. And just making sure that if you you know are trying to have a, a pleasant conversation, maybe a little bit more neutral, if you're smiling into the phone, people can hear that in your your tone, and it'll definitely make that um, more approachable if that's the the goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, obviously, looking the part is is what we've discussed before. If I came here today kind of disheveled or or had you know marker on my face that would distract you or I had a pattern shirt that was really bright um, really presenting yourself in the way you want to be perceived is the biggest takeaway from this dressing appropriately um, you know if you had buttons done up the wrong way it just speaks to your preparedness it speaks to your professionalism um, you know you don't again need to be spending a bunch of money but if you are up I used to actually keep uh, a change of clothes in my my uh, office just in case I needed to do media. I needed to have a blazer on um, just to look a little bit more professional or just to take away from maybe a distracting print. So always, if you're doing a lot of spokes uh, person acts in your role, make sure that you have it. I mean, all of us have eaten and spilt on our shirts. If you have to do media after that, um, you know, it's very beneficial just to plan ahead. And then choosing a location. So um, again, I've just picked well my kitchen or my eating area, but with a with a simple backdrop um, that's not too distracting, but it also doesn't have you know things like this behind it, where someone was doing the photo op and didn't realize that from a certain angle, um, it says things that will definitely nobody probably remembers what he was saying, but they do remember this photo same thing you don't want to give anyone a reason to take away from the message you're giving or in the world of social media give someone a meme that will make you uh very popular but probably not for the right reasons so effective communications another big thing to take away today is that regardless of what story you're telling decisions are emotional people make assumptions they they come to a conclusion based on emotions and that's something to really always consider when doing an interview or connecting with an audience so what shouldn't you do 
Um, again, coming back to, and journalists will do the same. They're looking for that emotional connection. So when talking to a journalist, don't consider anything off the record. Even if you say it or you have them stop the recording or you're out for, you know, building that rapport in a casual relationship, just be aware that they're always still doing their job similar to if you heard something at a barbecue that, you know, had to do with your employment, you might take a keener ear to that conversation or something that impacts your family, some news that that impacts your family. You will make that connection and nothing is off the record. Don't show discomfort, anger, or frustration. Um, that comes across in your tone, that'll come across in the, you know, the visuals that, that you'll be sharing with your audience. And it'll also show um, the journalists that they've kind of got under your skin and then they'll start to push for more information. So the more calm, cool and collected that you remain, the better off you are. Don't lie, guess or fake an answer. That will come back to bite you. So I would just say, you know what? I'm gonna talk to one of my experts and we'll get back to you. Or do you mind if I follow up with you on that, um, that question? I'm just gonna you know, get more information and I'll, I'll contact you directly. And that's where if you do have people doing communications, they can, they can get that information. Never feel like you have to answer something you don't know. People and the audience included or the people reading the, the, the news will appreciate hearing, you know what, I'm not 100% accurate or confident in my response. So I'm gonna get back to you. That's honesty and transparency, which in today's um, culture is very valuable. And then don't get too far into the specifics. Again, you wanna keep it high level. You want your message to be clear. And the more in the weeds you get, the more um, you know likelihood that that will happen. And don't ramble. Do think before you speak. If you need to take a breath, you need to repeat the question back. That will buy you about three seconds and your mind will race to, to, to come up with a response. Listen carefully. So make sure that you fully understand the question. Again, if you need to buy time, you can ask for them to repeat it. Um, but all of that is best positioned if you're prepared and you've practiced, practiced, practiced. Practiced in front of people, practiced in front of the mirror. Um, practice, you know, in, in sessions where you're doing some interview prep, um, just be really confident in what the message is you're trying to achieve and never steer away from it. So practice interview, as you're doing these, create realistic scenarios. Like I said, if you can make it more difficult than the interview, and not in a scary way, just in a realistic way, make it as real as it could be and ask the questions that could potentially be asked. Have those strategic discussions with your team and understand again, what is the biggest things you wanna take away? How do you position with the journalist or the story you're trying to tell? Um, in the interview, you know, always focus on those messages and always use the critique and analysis um, that can then help you out. So interview essentials so your tools getting started i won't take too long on this because it's kind of like more of a revision of what we focused on but be calm and friendly don't jump to an answer remember your first response sets the tone for the conversation so it's kind of like a first date where a journalist is trying to understand where you're going to go what your experience is with interviews your confidence level so really starting to set that tone. Now, don't fear if you don't feel like that first one was knock it out of your park. That doesn't mean that you can't come back. It's just really starting to set the tone for that conversation. Some quick tools is if you're doing broadcast, keep your quotes concise. They're probably gonna run it in a news story. They're looking for sound bites, snippets, one to two seconds. Um, so speak clearly and calmly and be prepared, be aware of your surroundings and backgrounds. Again, you don't wanna have one of those memes or one of those shots while you're trying to convey a very important message. And if you're doing pre-taping or anything like that, you can, it's not live, ask to start over. Um, it will always be helpful. You'll feel more confident knowing that you have that in your back pocket as well and feel free to use it if need be. If it's print or online, some tools to be considerate of are the deadlines. So as we talked, 
print is one where they're still filing. Um, but even in the world of online, they do want rapid responses, but sometimes they're reaching out proactively and might say, we're looking to write a story later next, later this week, and we're just wondering if we could get a quote or set up a time for an interview. You could be like, okay, you know, we're in the next two days work, may I ask what it's about? Um, what topic you would like to focus on? Is there who, you know, who else are you interviewing on this? Um, and then also what the, um, what the online timing is. So they might want to do the interview on a Tuesday if they're wrapping up the story for Friday and it's you know the Friday before. So they're setting themselves up to be able to see if the story has legs as well. So they might ask you for an interview and then decide that it's not worth it. So again, just having that clear line of communication open and understanding their online, their, their timelines, they'll respect you just as much for that and it'll put you in a good position. So do your homework on your talking points. Again, prepare um, and then provide background and context. So again, if you need something or there's, there's an article or there's an expert or um, other information that you can share, feel free to send it that way. You wanna equip the reporter or anyone to be able to write your story in from the best perspective possible. So oversharing on the, the topic of, of other references that's a great follow-up and it's also a way to open up that chain if in case they have follow-ups the bridge and pivot are just one of those tools that we talked about when you're coming out of the message if you don't want to answer what we're doing here today is this blah 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 you don't need to focus on what they asked or our objective uh the bridge and pivot also buys you a little bit of time to think of those words um that you want to put into your actual response so they're kind of sometimes used as a preamble or as a as a pivot back to the message that you want to drive so a great example is if someone says well you know this other company is saying x y and z and you're doing this and you can say, here's the difference between us. And I think the biggest takeaway is X. And that would be what your key message is or what's important here if they're trying to take you away and get you down a, you know, a rabbit hole is coming back to what's important, which are your key messages. Now, I wanted to take a few seconds just to go over and kind of talk about, you know, when we talk about that strategy, how to get your message out. It isn't always an interview. Um, there's different versions of, of media and media outlets and how you can tell your story. So I just wanted to take a minute to look at Ella as I know it's something and a case study that's very close to, to home for many of you. As we look at the entire presentation, we've talked about humanizing the story. We've talked about personifying the story. And this is a great case of, of a company that's actually created and embodied, um, you know, an electric, you know, driverless vehicle and given them a name, given them a personality um, and actually created, you know, a, a social media following for a, a vehicle as opposed to a person. So they're letting a vehicle tell the story, but there's a connection that people feel. You can see where Ella is, um, and that's the larger campaign as we've seen it across 20 countries, but as it's specific to Alberta, um, you also then have those local channels and websites designed to make sure that Ella you know you know where she is you know what she's up to and you have an opportunity to be a part of that um so i think when it comes to the humanizing telling a story great you also hear local stories about people that have connected or experienced ella the other thing is the key messages so this is a campaign that got ahead of all of the topics that you want to know um, is it reliable is it accessible is it innovative is it environmentally friendly and even right on their website or the messages they've driven really come back to you know the safety around a driverless vehicle the environmental impact it has the public transportation and impact it gives back to the community um, all of these things, the innovative technology that was used, and it's telling this holistic story um, through, through their messages, and they're consistent in that message. So 
I think the biggest thing is that this is a campaign where it was a very large campaign. It gave local feel because different campaigns came out of it, especially in some of your areas um, that Ella has visited. You can track track her, you can follow her journey, um, and you really can then create uh, a connection to this, this vehicle as well as the individuals that have been connected to that story as well. So this is a great way of also not putting a spokesperson up that's an individual, um, but actually telling this story through Ella and being able to share the story of the future of transportation, as well as the connection it has to um, society. So they've done a lot of really great things uh, that have to do with the research, which is all the, the key messages, the preparedness, they told a story, they built out a strategy and a campaign that really you know, went above and beyond um, and had so much positive uh, feedback and had those local feels. So great example um, as, as we move forward. So as I mentioned, um, I work for a company called Enterprise Canada. I'm the Western Canadian uh, vice president. Um, and we do media training, we do communication strategies, all those things. But I'm very fortunate that I was asked today to come and do some media training for you folks. And, and if you need anything else or uh, 